We will now look at the components of GDP based on the expenditure approach. The first component is consumer spending on final goods and services. This is often denoted by the symbol C. Then we have gross private domestic investment. This is denoted by I. And note that this is private investment, which means that it is the investments made by private firms, i.e. entities other than the government. This investment amount also includes the change in inventory. For example, if inventory at the start of the period is 10 million and it increases to 15 million, the increase of 5 million is also part of investment. The larger investment, though, typically would be the investment in property, plant, equipment, and so on. Government spending on final goods and services, that is denoted by G. And net exports, this is our external sector, and you can think of net exports as the expenditure by foreigners. Generally, this is denoted by X for exports minus M. In other words, if exports equal 100 and let's say imports equal 60, then the net exports number or the net expenditure by foreigners is 40. The three major sectors that we deal with are shown right here, household and business sectors this can be thought of as the private sector then we have the government sector and external sector households will earn a certain amount of money and from that income they will either consume or save and i am introducing you to these symbols which will be discussed in more detail later the business sector gets money from the financial markets either by borrowing or by issuing equity and the money is used to make investments. The government sector collects taxes. The amount of taxes collected is generally referred to as T. And then the expenditure or the government expenditure is referred to as G. We need to compare taxes which represents government revenue with the expenditure to determine whether there is a deficit or not. If the government expenditure is greater than revenue or taxes, then we say that there is a deficit. A point to note here is that the government also makes transfer payments, such as payments to those who are unemployed. These are generally referred to as unemployment benefits. These unemployment benefits are not included in the government expenditure because nothing is received in return for that expenditure. And this is a point I alluded to earlier where I said that government expenditure or the money that government spends on items such as unemployment benefit is not included in the GDP calculation. The external sector refers to trade and capital flows between a given country or a given economy and the rest of the world. A balance of trade deficit or what is generally referred to as a trade deficit means that a given domestic economy is spending more on foreign goods relative to how much foreign companies are spending on domestic goods. So if we come back to this example, you have a given economy and here is the rest of the world. Let's say that the money that is spent by this economy on foreign goods, which is represented by imports, is equal to 100 and the rest of the world is paying 80 over here. So this would represent export of goods to the rest of the world and the rest of the world paying 80 to the particular economy. Here we have a trade deficit because the exports number is lower than the imports number. The earlier deficit related to government expenditure and taxes 
is referred to as a fiscal deficit. There will be more on this material later. Exhibit 6 in the curriculum combines the various items that we are talking about. Notice that we have three markets and we talked about this in the very first reading in economics. We have the factor market, the goods market and financial markets. Through the factor market, households provide factors of production to firms. Factors of production would be land, labor and capital. In return, the firms pay households. The income is coming to the households. Now, what do households do with the income? There are three ways in which the income can be spent. One is consumption. Households go to the goods market and buy. So that is consumption. Households pay taxes. So the net taxes paid to the government, let's say, denoted by T. And households also save. So money put into the financial markets is essentially money saved and denoted by S. Firms borrow money from the financial markets. And I say borrow, but firms could also raise equity capital from financial markets. And that money is used for investments. The government buys goods and services from the goods market. As mentioned earlier, if there is a difference between revenue, government revenue, which is taxes, and government expenditure, then the government will need to borrow money. Government borrowing, in the case of a fiscal deficit, will happen through the financial markets. So this arrow represents government borrowing. And finally, we come to the external sector where we will have both exports and imports. So that is denoted by X minus M. Now, this picture summarizes all the components of the GDP, and that is done right here around our goods market. The summary expression for our GDP then becomes the following. GDP is equal to consumption plus investments plus government spending plus net exports or X minus M. And this is an important relationship to remember. We now come to section 2.3. Here we will continue our discussion on the GDP and we'll also talk about national income, personal income and personal disposable income. The reference for this particular segment is the Canadian economy and specifically GDP numbers related to the Canadian economy. If it is convenient for you, you can look at exhibits 9A and 9B in the curriculum. But even if you don't have the exhibits in front of you, you should be able to understand what I'm talking about. Broadly speaking, there are two ways of calculating the GDP. One is to use the expenditure approach and the other is to use the income approach. The expenditure approach is what we've talked about so far. And generally, this is the more popular way of estimating GDP because this data tends to be more easily available compared to data for the income approach. So, GDP based on the expenditure approach is a sum of multiple components. We have consumer spending on goods and services. This is referred to as C. Then we have business gross fixed investment plus change in inventories. These two collectively can be thought of as business investment. Then we have government spending on goods and services. So we can call this G and then C. And then government gross fixed investment, so GI. Some economies simply report one number for government spending, but the Canadian government separates these two. So it explicitly shows the government spending on goods and services. And then it also shows the government gross fixed investment. Then we have exports minus imports. These represent expenditures from the rest of the world. And then we have statistical discrepancy. 
We have this term because the GDP number that we calculate using the expenditure approach is generally different from the GDP number that we calculate using the income approach. And to balance these two or to equate these two, we need a plug and the statistical discrepancy number is that plug. Now let's talk about the GDP based on the income approach. When we calculate the GDP based on the income approach, this is called the gross domestic income. And one way of looking at this is that it is the sum of the net domestic income plus the consumption of fixed capital. This essentially is a measure of depreciation. And then we have a statistical discrepancy term. From an exam perspective, it's more important to understand this formula, which is the gross domestic income as a sum of factor incomes. So obviously one factor income is the compensation of employees. This includes the salaries plus wages that employees get plus any social security payments that employees get or people get from the government. Next we have the gross operating surplus. This represents corporate profits and the reason we call this gross is that we do not subtract rent, interest payments or payments related to other financial assets. So this is gross operating surplus. This is the gross operating surplus for corporations. It would also include non-profit organizations and so on. And then we have gross mixed income. This is the same concept except it applies to unincorporated businesses. So if we have a small farmer who has not incorporated his business, his income will come in this category. Then these last two points in a sense represent government income. We have taxes less subsidies on factors of production. This would include property taxes and payroll taxes. And then we have taxes less subsidies on products and imports. This would include sales tax, fuel tax, import duties and so on. Now, the Canadian government separates these two, but other governments might collectively report a taxes less subsidies number. Now, before moving on, I want to help you remember the key points here. So GDP based on the expenditure approach is consumer spending plus investments by businesses plus government spending plus expenditures by the rest of the world. And then we have net exports. And then we have statistical discrepancy. And with respect to government spending, some countries split this in two parts. So they can be government spending on final goods and services and then government spending on investment. Then when we talk about the gross domestic income, we have the compensation for employees. So I'll just call that E. Then we have the gross operating surplus. This represents corporate profits. Then we have the gross mixed income. This represents profits for unincorporated businesses. And then we have taxes less subsidies. And again, some countries break this into two parts. So you need to remember both these expressions. From national income, we move to personal income. Personal income is a broad measure of household income. It gives us a sense for consumers ability or people's ability to make purchases. The higher the personal income, the higher the consumption in a given economy. Personal income includes all income received by households, whether it is earned or unearned. Here is the formula for personal income. Personal income has three components. We have the compensation, so the total compensation received by employees, plus net mixed income for unincorporated businesses. Here we use net income as opposed to the previous slide where we talked about gross income. The point is that we need to subtract expenses so that what we are left with is income. So we have net mixed income and this refers to unincorporated businesses. And then we have net property income. So the combination of these three make up personal income. 
There is another term for personal income and that is primary household income. So primary household income, this term is used in the Canadian context. From personal income, we move to household disposable income. In simple terms, the household disposable income is equal to the personal income minus taxes. So if we have people over here, the money they receive is the personal income and then they pay taxes. The difference between the two, so personal income minus taxes, is the disposable income. That's the money that can be spent. But more formally, we use this expression over here, which is that household disposable income is equal to personal income minus net transfer payments. So what does this net transfer payments mean? The point here is that individuals might receive transfer payments from the government. So there might be some people who are receiving social security checks. This expression over here, net transfer payments, is the net payment made to the government. So if we consider taxes being paid and transfer payments being received, the difference between the two is a net amount. And this net amount will be what is being paid to the government because overall taxes will always be higher than transfer payments. So the combination of taxes paid to the government and transfer payments received from the government is what we are talking about here. Next, we have household net savings. The starting point here is household disposable income. From the disposable income, we subtract household final consumption expenditure, and then we add the net change in pension settlements. That gives us household net savings. Let's look at a simple example now, and I want you to solve this problem before looking at the answer. We are given some data related to calculating the GDP using the expenditure approach. I want you to use this information and come up with the GDP using the expenditure approach. And then I want you to use this data to calculate the GDP using the income approach. So here is what you need to do. Using the expenditure approach, you need to recognize that GDP is consumption plus government expenditure plus investment, plus exports minus imports, plus statistical discrepancy. For consumption, you can plug in this number. The investment is the sum of these two numbers, which is 130. You might be wondering what happened to government expenditure. And the way this information is presented, government expenditure is built into these two accounts because here we say final consumption expenditure. So this means consumer expenditure and government expenditure in goods and services. And then here we are talking about gross fixed capital formation. So this refers to investments made by business and capital investments made by the government. So the government is covered by these two accounts. X minus M is 70 minus 80, and the statistical discrepancy is minus 10. When you do the calculation, you should get 410. And then when you use the income approach, you are adding these numbers. So compensation of employees, then we have the gross operating surplus, the mixed income, the taxes, and the statistical discrepancy. And here again, you should get 410.